So you guys like. You are now wishing that you didn't raise your hand, aren't you? <laughs> you know, I feel a little bad this summer because um, on some level, when we normally, during the fall and winter and spring, we have kids at this point go to their age-appropriate classes, but you've been sitting in with us adults the whole summer, so I thought today that I would make our time a little more interactive for you guys. So don't fall asleep. <laughs> Engage with us. Talk to me about what your favorite games are, and adults too. Just speak it out. What do you like? What, what games do you like? Yeah. You like video games? I bet you're not the only one. What do you like? Candyland? Nice. Board games? Me too. Anybody else? What kind of games do we like? Softball? I love baseball when my team wins like yesterday. It was a really good day for Red Sox fans. Friday wasn't so hot for me, but, but yesterday was a good day for games. What else do we like? It's great when your team wins. When your team doesn't win, you don't like the game so much. You know, when I was a kid, I loved to play hide-and-seek. Anybody like to play hide-and-seek? Yeah. Yeah, it was so fun. There were certain key places that I had that nobody could find me. I'd be there, and the game would be over, and I'd still be in my spot. There was this bush near my front yard that looked like it was full, but there was a little entryway on the back, and inside it was kind of hollow. So when you were walking by the bush, there was no way unless you knew that that was the case, that that was the perfect hiding place, but it was the perfect hiding place until a couple of my friends found out that you could do that, and then it was no longer the perfect hiding place. To go up in trees, hide behind bushes, abandoned buildings, there were places that I would go. How many of you guys who liked hide-and-seek or who still like hide-and-seek, how many of you guys love to be the seeker, the person who was looking after the people who were hiding? Anybody like to be the seeker? Everybody likes to be the hider, right? Yeah? Yeah, I, I think me too. I think that's kind of built into our DNA. And in fact, the older I've gotten, the more I realize that I'm actually better at this game now than I was then. And I bet some of you are too. As we get older, our tendency to want to hide, either because we've said something that we shouldn't have said, or we've done something that we shouldn't have done, we're, we're afraid or we're ashamed. You know, I, I even still, pastor that I am, I still am pretty good at this, of wearing masks, of building walls, of making you see somebody that's not really me. I'm pretty good at hiding. And I bet some of you are too. I think, you know, right from the beginning in Genesis, when Adam and Eve were created and God desired nothing but harmony and unity and oneness with them, upon their disobedience and rebellion to what he asked of them, the very first thing that they did was what? They went and hid. This seems crazy, right? How can you hide from God? I mean, we can hide from each other pretty well, but hiding from God seems, well, a bit futile. And yet, you're not the only one that I try to hide from sometimes. Sometimes, I try to hide from God. And I bet some of you do too. In your most honest moments, if I were to ask you or hook you up to a lie detector test, I bet, <laughs> I bet it would show me that sometimes I try to do silly things like hide from God. You know, when I'm just afraid or ashamed, whatever it might be. Well, this morning, the psalm that we're going to be looking at, we've been going through a series called our Summer Playlist, and we've been looking at a lot of different kinds of psalms, different people's favorite psalms in our church. And this morning, it's Psalm 139. Now, this, this psalm defies category because in its entirety, there are places in the psalm that would fit a lament, there are places that would fit the category of imprecatory psalm. There are places that would work with a trust psalm or a praise psalm. So it really sort of defies category. It kind of sits out there by itself. And so what I want to do is explore a little bit this psalm and then make some observations that I hope will be helpful for you. It's really, really simple psalm when you reduce it down. 
And so it's, I'm almost embarrassed with its simplicity to tell you some things that I think might be important for you to know. Now, again, as I told you, today I want to be a little bit interactive. So if you're new or you're shy or you don't really feel like playing along, no pressure. You don't have to. But this will work better if all of us, and we're positioned so that we can kind of see each other and hear each other and interact, we're positioned in such a way that this will work well if we do. So there are three parts to the first 12 verses. And I would love for the first section, verses 1 through 4, which will be up on this screen, I would love for this group of people who are facing me here to read together what's on the screen. Verses 5 through 8 will be this section and this section. You'll read 5 through 8. In between each, we'll just take a brief pause. And then 9 through 12 is this section. Okay? So, as we read, remember, it is impossible to play hide-and-seek with God. And this is what David is telling us. So, if this group... And I'll get started reading with you. But if this group can read this first part, one through four, join me now. Lord, you have examined me. You know all about me. You know when I sit down, when I get up. You know my thoughts before I think them. You know where I go and where I lie down. You know well everything I do. Lord, even before I say a word, you already know what I'm going to say. Just sit with that for a moment. Sometimes when we read, we just read on right through. But sometimes it's good to just sit with a thought and to realize how poignant this is. Good job, you guys. Verses 5 through 8, my peeps over here. You are all around me, in front and in back. You have put your hand on me. Your knowledge is amazing to me. It is more than I can understand. Where can I go to get away from your spirit? Where can I run from you? If I go up to the skies, you're there. If I lie down where the dead are, you are there. No bush, no tree, no grave, no sky, no place. My people over here. If I rise with the sun in the east and settle in the west beyond the sea, even there you would guide me. With your right hand you would hold me. I could say, the darkness will hide me. The light around me will turn into night. But even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as light as the day. Darkness and light are the same to you. Now you hear those 12 verses. And for some of us, that's comforting. There's no place on planet earth that you and I can go that God isn't already there, right? Because sometimes in life we get lonely, desperately lonely, and we feel alone. Sometimes we want to be alone, and it's good that we are, but sometimes when we're alone we don't want to be. And so this is a very comforting thought in these first 12 verses, that there's no place that we can escape the gaze of God. But for some of us, and in different stations in life, the very same people, it's unnerving. Because there are places that we would like to go to escape the gaze of God. There are times when we're not happy with ourselves. And for some of us, that happens more often than we like. That's why we hide. Because to be completely open, to be entirely vulnerable when we're not in a position where we want to be, is scary, isn't it? But there's something that we're going to get at as the psalm develops that tells us that even on our worst day, there is no reason for us to fear hiding from God. 
I want you to think of the worst day. <laughs> Some of the things that if you could take back that you absolutely would, but you can't, and now you're stuck on some level with things you've said, things you've done, things you didn't do. Your worst, no good, horrible, very bad day. And that's open in the presence of God. And for some of us, that's encouraging. But for some of us, it's unnerving. First part is, it's a futile game to play with God, hide and seek. So we just shouldn't invest our energies in that way. We should invest our energies differently, and I'm going to tell you about that in just a minute. Now, verses 13 to 18, you're going to hear and see in this video. We're not going to read it together. We're going to watch it. I want you to watch, and I want you to listen, and I want you to open to what it is that this girl shares with us. Well, we'll go with this one <laughs> and then see what I can do with this. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit? And when I rise. You, you will see my thoughts. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before wound is on my tongue. You okay? You must be. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you. I praise you. I place you. I praise you. Because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your love works so wonderful. My frame was not hidden from you. Uh, I'm in a sacred place. Where I was woven together in the depths of the earth. You eyes on my unseen body. My eyes were made with the for me. On the day you are dating for me. Well, Winton in your book. They were very meaningful to be. Are the sum of them? Right, I count them. Out in the earth, the sand. I am fearfully. I'm fearfully. I'm fearfully. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Beautiful, nevertheless. Really, really good. Fearfully and wonderfully made. There's this part in the psalm where we, where we understand that we're never beyond the gaze of God, but then there's this other part where we reflect on the goodness of our own creation. I don't, I don't think most of us do that enough. You think? I think most of us think about the things that aren't right, don't we? Maybe that's because how we were raised, or maybe that's how those around us treat us, or maybe it's internal, but whatever the case, I think oftentimes we don't reflect well on the goodness of God. Hey, listen, I'm going to use a $20 bill, but I need somebody else who has a 20 too. Um, do I have anybody who would trust me enough to give me a $20 bill? All right, Steve. And I need somebody who is 12 or under to be my volunteer. Thank you, Steve. You will get it back. I can't tell you what shape or form it will be in, but you will get it back. Do I have somebody 12 or under who would love to be a volunteer with me? No volunteering of others. Awesome. My friend, can you tell everybody your name? 
course you are. So Taya, here's what I would like for you to do. I would love for you, now don't rip it in half, but I want you to treat this $20 bill, Andrew Jackson, as if you don't like him at all. You can crumble it, spit on it, step on it. I want you to treat Andrew like you just don't like him at all, but don't rip it in pieces, anything short of that. Okay, just crumble it, step on it, tell it it's not as good as its brother Benjamin, <laughs> whatever you want to do, okay? Can you just like really go to town on that $20 bill? Like, like you don't like it. Like you're... <laughs> Hey, come here. Why can't you be more like Benjamin? Got anything else you want to do to it? Tell you, that was great. Thank you. <laughs> she was too nice, but I'm not. Now, What's the difference between this one and this one with its value and worth? What's this one worth? What's this one worth? No matter what people say to you or do to you, no matter what in life happens, no matter what flaw or failure or struggle you have, your inherent value doesn't change. And you need to know that, because oftentimes when we are pushed to the margins, when we are beaten down, when we are talked to terribly, when people spit on us and treat us unfairly, we feel as if somehow our value has been diminished. Our value doesn't change. What was a 20 is always a 20. This has the exact same value as this. And you need to know that, because I think Many of you in this room don't know that. You've forgotten that. And sometimes you do it to yourself. And so, I'd like to flip the script. I'd like for us to take a moment in that section when you saw those children and adults talking about how they were fearfully and wonderfully made. There was something within them that felt like pride to me like a good kind of pride, like happiness for how God had made them. And they weren't perfect, were they? But they were happy about how God made them. And I wonder if we can't just for 30 seconds or a minute or two get in touch with how God made us that piece or place that we're happy about. You know, I don't want us to think or talk about right now the things that we wish we could change. I want us to talk about that thing that we're really happy about how God made us. How God made our bodies or our minds, how He shaped our souls to connect with Him, an experience we've had, or something in our life. I want you to think about that. And now this is where the risky part gets. Because, believe it or not, for those of you who do not know me, I am super introverted. If I were sitting in your space, my knees would be knocking with what I'm about to ask you to do. So this will be hard for some of you, but I want you to do it anyway. Sometimes in life there are things that are hard and you just need to do them anyway. So I'd love for you to turn to your neighbor and I would love for you to tell them one thing about yourself that you're happy about how God made you. One thing about your body, your mind, the way in which God has gifted you in some way, a skill you have, an experience you've had. I want you to focus and reflect on the wonderful and the beautiful, the good. And I want you to do that for 30 to 60 seconds. So talk with one another, and if you're struggling, just use that time and don't press each other. Talk to your neighbor about the goodness of God.
fare. Okay, 20 more seconds. 20 more seconds. Okay, thank you guys. Okay, let's come on back together. You know, it makes me happy to hear all of that because it means that you're getting in touch with some aspect about yourself that you really need to just live in gratitude for. There's nobody else like you. There's no one on planet Earth like you. And I get that there's some space between the real and the ideal versions of ourselves, and that's, that's why we're trying to grow. So what we're trying to get at is, is the best versions of ourselves. And sometimes in order to get there, we need to know that we have some steady ground from which to go. And that steady ground is, is that we are beautifully and wonderfully and fearfully crafted by a designer expert. And how we are is how God made us to be. And no matter what people say and what people do, and no matter how trampled in life we may feel, the second part of this psalm that we need to be in touch with is the inherent goodness of you. God is always with us, and you are definitely good. And some of you have forgotten that, and you just need to be reminded. And so when you're forgetting that, I'd ask you to go back to Psalm 139, verses 15 to 18, and camp out there for a while. Because, you know, when David was writing this psalm, David had a lot of stuff going on in his life. It wasn't just unicorns and butterflies and rainbows for old King David. There was stuff inside of him that wasn't as it should be, and that's the next movement in our psalm. God's always there. And you're always good, inherent in your creation. But this next part, it, like, it just sort of doesn't fit. Now, do I have anybody who would be willing to say that at least when you came in, that you were just kind of angry? Is this something like going on in your life that you're not happy about? Or, or that you have a good angry voice? Does anybody here have a good angry voice? Raquel, I would love it. So, so this next part of the psalm is yours that I want you to read in that angry voice. <laughs> because that's the next movement with our psalm. So it's Psalm 139, 19 to 22. We've had this, God knows wherever I am, and he loves me, and I'm wonderfully created. But then this comes, okay, in an angry voice, Raquel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that'd be a good idea. God, I wish you would kill the wicked, get away from me, you murderers, these men say evil things about you. Your enemies use your name faultlessly. Lord, I hate those who hate you. I hate those who rise up against you. I feel only hate for them. They are my enemies. That's good. There is a place in our life, in the presence of God, where we are free and really where we must allow those dark, hard, difficult places to be exposed to the gaze of God. There is this place where it is time to stop hiding from the parts that we wished weren't there from those angry places 
that are unresolved. Sometimes the most important thing that's going on in our life with God is that God is trying to help us see ourselves. And the only way we will bring our junk to light is if we trust in the basic goodness of our creation and we feel safe in the presence of the one who we will deliver that to. If we think somehow that when we share this junk with God that we're going to be judged or that we are going to be looked upon differently or more harshly or that there's going to be recrimination for it, then we're not going to do it, are we? We can only, in the light of God's presence, share the darkest elements of who we are if we have a basic understanding as to who God is and who we are. And for some of us, it's long overdue that that stuff in God's presence gets exposed. Your husband or wife already know that that's there. Your children know that's there. Your parents know that's there. Your friends, those who know you most closely, why? Because you can't contain junk. Junk spills over. Your fears, your anger, your judgments, your pride, your lust, all of these things that are inside of you that have somehow found a home but are really not welcome there, they need to be exposed in the light of God's redemptive grace. And so what seems disjointing fits perfectly, really, because as David writes this psalm and he reflects on God's all-knowing, all-prevailing presence in our lives and on the inherent goodness, he doesn't pretend that there aren't parts of us that still need work. And so, David spews in this one just unending, like seemingly... Um, just burst of anger and hatred, he, he spills this forth. And, and it's in the Bible, which means, like, there's a place for it, right? Sometimes we feel like there's stuff in our life that there isn't a place for. Sometimes the most important place there is, is in the presence of God. God's really oftentimes the only one who can handle such vitriol and anger, Perhaps if those who were in Charlottesville would have been doing a little more of that, there would be a little less violence on one another. So there is a place. And with our praises come our pain. It's not either or, it's both and. I hold one in one hand and I hold the other in the other. And they work together because they're all me. If I start pretending that one piece of that isn't, then I'm going back to the bush, to the tree, to the abandoned warehouse, and I'm hiding what most needs to be exposed in the presence of God to His loving gaze so that He can help me do something about it. Because sometimes the most important thing that God does is to help me see me. Because believe it or not, you and I, we occasionally have blind spots. And we cannot see what almost everybody else Isn't that funny? It's not so much so when it's you. Almost everybody else can see aspects of us that we cannot see ourselves. But when we're honest with ourselves and we're honest with God, we can bring it out into His redemptive light and it can change. It can be redeemed and healed. All right, hit me with this last part, Dave. So then the psalm ends this way. God, examine me and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there's any bad thing in me and lead me in the way that you set long ago. So he like gets to the end of his anger and he's like, oh man, maybe in my righteous, self-righteous anger, maybe there's something that shouldn't be there. I got that out and I feel a little bit better now that it's off my chest, but like in order for me not to pick it back up and take it with me when I leave, would you just help me see me? as I am? Would you help me to see the good, the bad, and the ugly? And Would you point out to me the stuff that's good, and would you point out to me the stuff that just doesn't need to be there, and would you and I partner together with me to help me do something about this? He comes to some place of resolve. He wants to be better. And you want to be better, don't you? 
Nobody wants to sit with their junk. It's a heavy, heavy weight. The older you get, the longer you carry with you, it's like it starts to impact your back and your shoulders. You don't know this, kids, but as you get older, if you carry junk with you, it starts to do a number on your body. It so stresses you out, your neck and your shoulders and your back, you start to feel it in your body because you're carrying stuff that you just were never meant to carry. And some of you, unfortunately, who are younger, already feel that. And I just got to tell you, kids, it's time to just understand that on our worst days, we're okay, and God's okay with letting us be that and bring that to Him so that He can help us know what to do with it. We don't have to forever be the way we are. We can change with God's help. And the reason that He fixes His gaze on us is because He wants in life to partner with us to live into the best versions of ourselves. That's what He wants. That's what God wants. God wants us to be just like His Son, Jesus. And for many of us, there's a lot of work to be done between where we are and Jesus, right? But He's willing if we're willing. He's able. He can help us if we want to be helped. So, we're at the end. Here's the two things I want to do at the end. In your bulletin when you came in, there was a sheet. Uh, if you didn't get a bulletin on the way in, maybe on the way out you will pick one up. But that sheet gives you an understanding of how to do an ancient practice called examine, how to walk through your life and look at the last sort of 24 hours of your day with God so that you can see the things that you need to see and to make adjustments along the way. It's, a very, it's an ancient practice. It's a helpful one. I hope that you will take it with you and put it someplace that you can see it. I'm not going to walk through it, but if you have questions as you're practicing, because like if you don't do this practice, I'm not going to give or not give you a gold star. It's for you. It's to help you understand how to do Psalm 139. Okay? For those of you who will lose this piece of paper as soon as you leave, I would like for you to pull out your phone. This is going to be a rare thing where I ask you to pull your phone out, but I would love for you to pull out your phone. Okay, and on your phone, if you have one, there's a place for apps for many of you. I didn't even know what an app was like a few months ago. But, <laughs> but on mine, it's a blue square and an A, and I want you to punch that. And at the top, when you punch your app, in the search category, I want you to type E, X, A, M, E, N. Okay. And I want you to see what comes up. Now, I hope our Wi-Fi is working. Is it working? Okay. Okay. So I'll repeat again. Great. So E X A M E N. Examine. And mine is not working, but Annette's is working. So, Annette, when you, when you get to this place, examine, it's going to give you a site called Reimagining the Examen. And when you can add it, I want you to add it, okay? Because on this site, it's going to give you like about 30 or 40 different ways to do an examen. And it'll take you five or ten minutes, but literally, as you swipe or slide your phone, it just gives you like a prompt on that particular place. Why am I asking you to do this? Because I know that some of you are going to lose this piece of paper. But I know that most of you are not going to lose your phone. And I desperately want you to do this practice. Why? Because I believe that you want to be better. And I believe that even if you're afraid, that you want in God's presence to see yourself as you are so that you can live into the fullest, best version of who God wants you to be. And this practice has been extremely helpful in my own life. And so I am passing it on to you. So if you can get it on your phone or you can't get it on your phone here, just remember, examine, you type it in, you download the app, and just play around with it and use it. It's going to walk you through the previous 24 hours of your life, and you're going to look with God at certain things you need to see. Okay?
Okay. Well, that's about it for today. I hope that as a result of looking at and listening to this psalm in a different way that it's become personal, it will be on your playlist. Next week, we have two weeks left in this series. Next week, we're going to get to my favorite psalm. It's Rayon's favorite too, so we share that in common. Psalm 46. I'm going to break Psalm 46 down for you. And then the last week, which will be August 27th, we're going to do a little remix. We're going to look at some of the different psalms, and we're going to interact with some people who've had some experiences, either with some of the practices or the psalms themselves. We're going to talk and learn from our entire experience as we draw it together. And then we will move into the fall with a new turning the page, with a new theme and a new idea for us as a community. Okay? If you would stand with me, let's close in prayer. Hey, just before I close in prayer, I know today is Gabrielle's last day. I know it's Dexter's last day. They're going to college. Is there anybody else? Is there any other collegians going this week to college? They're going to be going staggered over the next few weeks. So, Gabrielle and Dexter, we love you. We're praying for you. We wish you the best. We know you're going to have a great year. So just know that God's gaze is on you and that you have a group of people, a community that love and support you. And we're so thankful for you, okay? We're going to be praying for you. God bless you guys. So let's, let's pray. Lord, thank you for all that you, all that you are doing in our lives. We thank you that we are reminded today that you are constantly with us and for us that we are good and that you desire to do good things even out of our bad things. And so we trust ourselves to you and we ask that as we solidify those notions that we can just begin to walk in to the best versions of ourselves. We, we bless you and we thank you for this time together. Lead us into new and everlasting ways, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you guys.